The case of the Aldabra banded snail. First, the story of how the snail died. The story begins with an article in Biology Letters by Justin Gerlach. He's a mollusk expert and he's the scientific coordinator of the Nature Protection Trust of Seychelles and chairman of the Red List of Endangered Terrestrial and Freshwater Invertebrates. So he should know what he's talking about. The article is entitled Short-Term Climate Change and the Extinction of the Snail Rachista aldabrae, Gastropoda pulmonata. And uh, it's on the internet for free, so you can read it anytime you want. The abstract goes the only population of the only known population of the aldabra banded snail, Rachista aldabrae, declined through the late 20th century, leading to its extinction in the late 1990s. This occurred within a stable habitat, and its extinction is attributable to decreasing rainfall on an Aldabra Atoll, associated with regional changes in rainfall patterns in the late 20th century and early 21st century. It is proposed that the extinction of this species is a direct result of decreasing rainfall leading to increased mortality of juvenile snails. Now, after reading that, how many of you think that the snail is extinct? Um, certainly, that's the impression given by the, uh, by the abstract. Introduction, island populations have long been of particular interest to evolutionary biologists due to their role in the development of the theory of evolution, providing important data for both Darwin and Wallace and magnifying general processes of colonization, extinction, and scaling in classic island biogeography theory. And there's some references, one of them quite new. Few islands have been the focus of research interest for long enough for the accumulation of useful data sets for long-term monitoring, notable exceptions being Barrow, Colorado, and the Galapagos Islands. Aldabra Atoll in the Seychelles group has been one of the most intensively studied small islands over the past 100 years with particularly intensive research since 1968. This includes long-term monitoring of giant tortoises, uh, habitats, and invasive coccid in insects. And in case you're wondering where Aldabra uh, Atoll is located, it's right there. Now, a little map of the island itself. Um, I think this is called Malabar, this is Grand Terre, there's, uh, um, and this one is actually uh, listed as Palimni Island. And then uh, we're going to have all those named in just a little bit. Um, but that happens to be a free map that I could show you. Um, this is a photo from the Aldabra Foundation, and if you look over here you can see this channel. That's the channel right here, the main channel. See, this is an atoll, and so inside there's water, and when the tide goes up and down, the water has to get out. So most of it goes through the main channel, and there's a little subsidiary channel that uh, is between uh, the main island and the uh, second biggest island. Um, on the, in the photo, it looks pretty... Um, pretty green. There's a recent National Geographic special that shows uh, the giant tortoises all huddled under one bush. I presume that must be somewhere in here because the rest of it looks like there'd be plenty of bushes to hide under. Apparently if they don't hide under them during the day they get cooked. N to continue the article, no monitoring has been carried out on indigenous invertebrates. Most invertebrate con, uh, collections on the uh, atoll date back to the 1970s with the exception of terrestrial mollusks. Land snail collections on Aldabra were first made in 1895, with occasional collections since then and extensive surveys in 1997, 2000, and 2005. Examination of collection material allows the evaluation of distribution and abundance changes, uh, change for the largest and most distinctive Aldabran snail species the banded snail, Rachista aldabrae. Rachista aldabrae is endemic 
to Aldabra Atoll, where it has been recorded from the islands of Picard, Malabar, Palumne, Esprit, and Grand Terre. Picard is, I think, the one that the, that the uh, outpost is on. Malabar is the second biggest, and of course, Grand Terre is the biggest. Um, notice that this was published by Gerlach himself the year before he wrote the paper that we're reading. Bachista is a widespread genus in Africa and Asia, particularly in coastal woodlands. No detailed studies of R. aldabre have been carried out, but several visitors to the atoll, wait a minute, no detailed studies of R. aldabre have been carried out. So we know it's extinct, but it hasn't actually been studied. Uh, something, okay. But several visitors to the atoll since 1895 have collected specimens deliberately or incidentally in general invertebrate sampling. The last specimen was collected in 1997. Since then, extensive searches have been made for this species in many parts of the atoll, including all localities where the species had been recorded previously, in 2005 and 2006. But only old shells, estimated to date back at least five years, could be located. Climatic and habitat variables are known to affect the stability of some snail populations, bar and bar. And the aim of this paper is to investigate the possible factors contributing to the apparent decline of R. aldabra, including habitat change and, and climate. We're going to call it apparent decline, but earlier we were calling it extinction. Okay. Material and methods collections uh, con uh, containing specimens of R. aldabra were invest examined and the data collected, uh, collated to investigate the pattern of change in distribution, abundance, and demography of the species from 16 collections spread over 102 years, Table 1 and Figure 1a. This covers all collections from aldabra, both institutional and private, known to the author. So uh, he did a pretty good survey, it sounds like. The probability of population survival was evaluated using Solon's Bayesian estimation, which is sensitive to absence records toward the end of runs of data, as in the present case. Shells were measured with dial calipers accurate to 0.1 millimeter. Individuals were sized to four sizes or age categories, neonatal, juvenile, subadult, and adult, greater than 14 millimeters with a slight limp. That's about the width of the, your little finger. <coughs> The, an, the effects of annual temperature extremes and rainfall and the number of specimens collected were investigating using data from Aldaba Research Station covering various periods. And by comparing changes in vegetation cover between 1988 and 2005 when no specimens could be located. In 2005, vegetation data were collected by identifying all individual plants over one meter tall along four meter wide transects on Malabar Island. So that's 12, they divide everything into about 13 foot uh, sections and then recorded what was on there. And apparently somehow they marked some of it so that they were able to repeat the study years later. Um, where diverse uh, types, vegetation types were recorded in 1988. The 1,050 meter transect, it's 1,000 meters, that's a kilometer, was divided into 50 meter sections. This is the same method employed in the previous studies. Results, re recent shells of live snails were recorded on the main island of Picard, Malabar, and Grand Terre during 1907 to 1976. After that, only two isolated fresh specimens have been found, both on Picard. In 1907, this species was noted as being particularly abundant in the Karupa area of Grand Terre. This locality was visited in 2000, and no evidence of any recent survival of the species was found. Apparently some old shells. Probability of population survival is shown in Table 1, indicating that there would be no significant probability of survival by 2012. These calculations indicate that this species is probably already extinct as 95% probability of extinction is attained when the critical value of, last, of the last sighting is exceeding, ex exceeded. This is calculated in 2006. So he's writing a paper in 2007. Looks like 
there's only a 5% chance that it could, live, uh, could be still living. Actually, he makes the case now that it's worse than that. This analysis assumes that all surveys are comparable. However, the pre-1997 collections are incidental and probably indicate high levels of abundance of the species. Post-1997 surveys have been more systematic and in 2005 and 2006 comprised exhaustive surveys focused specifically on locating Aldabra. How do you do an exhaustive survey for something that's 5, 10 miles across? Um, the absence of any recent shells or live specimens in those surveys further supports the view that this species is extinct. Significant correlations were found with annual rainfall. While the relationship between snail numbers and rainfall may not be expected to be linear or normally distributed, simple linear regression provides a statistically significant result applicable to the limited data available. No R. aldabrae were recorded in years where rainfall fell below 966 millimeters. For references, that's over three feet of rain. That'd be kind of nice right now in Southern California. And here's the linear regression, although if you will notice, if I'm eyeballing this, this looks like it's better explained by an exponential curve rather than a linear uh, regression, but whatever. No significant differences were found between the samples for any plant species using a two-factor analysis of variance, excluding pieces species found only as a single individuals, treating abundance of each species as a dependable var dependent variable, and 50 meter sections as the replication units, indicating that habitat change is unlikely to be a significant contributor to Al our Aldabra population decline. And I think this is italicized in the original. I just missed re-italicizing it. Over 30 years of rainfall data, 17 were below uh, 1,023 millimeters. Such years occurred as isolated dry years or two consecutive dry years until 1999. Since then, all six years for which data are available have been dry. Both the frequency of low, fall, low rainfall years and the length of dry periods have increased. Uh, during the 1970-1980, there were three low rainfall years compared with seven during 1994 to 2003. And this is statistically significant for frequency of low rainfall years. Anyway, for... Uh, you can digest that at your leisure. Presumably under three feet of... Uh, rainfall, Ni 960 millimeters to be precise. <coughs> Discussion. No specimen of R. aldabrae have been located since 1997 despite extensive searching and as most the most recent remains appear to date from approximately 2000, this species is considered to be extinct. Now that's kind of halfway between apparent decline and extinction period, I guess. During the periods of drought, R. aldabrae estivated on the branches of shrubs. Decreases in rainfall would have reduced the length of activity periods. This may not have been a major additional cause of mortality to adults, but the small juveniles would be less able to tolerate the desiccation. Consequently, long dry periods would be expected to reduce reproductive success with complete failure in prolonged dry periods. So there's a reasonable mechanism. This pattern may be analogous to increased embryonic mortality associated with raised temperature seen in other snail species, although no correlation with temperature was detected in R. aldabrae. So this is climate change, but not global warming. Climate being, of course, more dry. This may be one of the few cases of extinction that cannot be attributed to a change in habitat predators or diet, but may plausibly result from the direct impacts of climate on survival. Climate change, so he's connecting those two things, have been proposed, uh, has been proposed as a factor leading to the decline of many species, either directly or through indirect associations, such as host parasite dynamics, 
There are a few cases where this has been de demonstrated directly, the golden toad, bufo, uh, periglensis, and again, I probably missed italicizing that. Um, although indirect reports are r reported for a large number of amphibian species. Cyclical patterns in rainfall have been reported from Aldabra, but the decrease in rainfall described here appears to be distinct from those and, most cl and closely matches patterns from East and Southern Africa. It's uh, regional rather than just in the Seychelles themselves. At present, the data from Aldabra are too limited to confirm that the climate change pattern is part of the drying trend of Southern Africa and not merely a local or short-term phenomenon. However, it is to be expected that the impacts of the, climate cha uh, of the changes reported here will be detected in more species in the future as rainfall patterns change. Um, at the very end, after references and stuff, there is a notice of correction. The genus name is now correct, 24 August 2007. There are no other corrections noted. So, well, uh, this was kind of interesting, of course, and it made it into the proceedings of the Royal, Acad uh, see, the Royal Society, I think it's the Royal Society of London, Proceedings B. And um, the uh, title is called, How Does Climate Change Cause Extinction? And again, that's available on the internet. Ah. Um, and the paragraph where it kind of made it into this paper um, is right here where it says, but C82 is a reference to Gerlach's paper that we just uh, read most of. Um, and, you know, finally we note that we did not specifically address global species extinction in, in association with the climate change in our review. And to go on, they, they mention uh, frogs, snails, freshwater fishes, six birds. Other four birds are island species possibly impacted by storms, the ver severity of which may be related to climate change. And now you get an idea of why flightless birds actually have an advantage on an island because they can't get blown off the island. Um, uh, and one island rodent species. In almost all cases, the links between extinction and anthropogenic climate change are speculative, but see 82. So 82 is the example that you can say climate change actually did it. Although notice, it's not actually global warming, it's just global drying. Uh, which is why these cases were not included previously in our review. Intriguingly, none of the 20 is clearly related to limited tolerances to high temperature. It's climate change, not global warming, that's doing these things in. Now, the Cahill study made it all the way into the IPCC in the AR5, published in 2014. And again, you can get the whole report on the internet, and chapter four can be gotten itself. And um, uh, in section 4.3.2.5.5, Observe global extinctions, we read, uh, global species extinctions, many of them caused by human activities, are now occurring at rates that approach or exceed the upper limits of observed natural rates of extinction in the fossil record. However, across all taxa, there's only low confidence that rates of species extinctions have increased over the past several decades. Most extinctions over the past several centuries have been attributed to habitat loss, overexploitation, pollution, or invasive species. And these are the most important current drivers of extinction. So the traditional eco ec ecological uh, drivers are still the most common reason. Of the more than 800 global extinctions documented by the IUCN, only 20 have been tenuously linked to recent climate change. And there's Cahill's article that cites our article as the one that's actually been proven. Mollusks, especially freshwater mollusks, have by far the highest rates of documented extinction of all species groups. 
Well, it made an interesting story. Global climate change, global drought, or at least regional drought, killed the Aldabra snail. The problem with that story is the snail was found. The Times, September 20, 2014, documents the finding. Unfortunately, to read all of that article, you will have to pay money. So I'll just give you the first two paragraphs, since those are available for free. It was presented as shocking evidence of the damage being done by climate change. A species driven to extinction because of a decline in rainfall in its only habitat. So this is a big deal, apparently, at the time. Gerlach made himself a name on this paper. Now, the rediscovery of his species of snail is prompting questions about the role played by the Royal Society, Britain's most prestigious scientific institution, in raising false alarm over an impact of climate change. And the story goes on. And they have an accompanying photo of the snail. This is post it being declared dead. Um, and uh, there's another photo that's supposedly of the first one they found. And you'll notice that it forms the background of the, this actually I think is from National Geographic, but it uh, comes through uh, what's up with that. And then there's one from the Seychelles News Agency. If you want to look at the, uh, there's actually two very nice photos. That, that snail shell that you saw actually has a creature underneath it. And it looks mm, pretty much like a standard snail. Except it has this beautiful little pink stripe going around its shell, which is otherwise mostly deep purple except for the, all the cred that's on there. This led to a confession. In Biology Letters 2014, and it's on the internet, and um, there's the photo of the actual article. Um, in 2007, we published an article by Justin Gerlach reporting that the population of the Alba Aldabra banded snail, Machista Aldabra, had declined during the latter part of the 20th century and had become extinct in the late 1990s. This conclusion was based on analysis of data from a range of cell connections made across the different islands of the Aldabra Atoll from 1895 through 2006. Gerlach noted that no juveniles had been collected since 1976 and no live adults since 1996, despite systemic sur systematic surveys aimed specifically at finding the snail in 2005 and 2006. After examining the data, Gerlach discounted changes in habitat, because he saw that there were no changes in habitat, predator pressure, or diet as reasons for the population change. He argued on the basis of correlation between snail numbers and rainfall that its decline in proposed extinction was due, boy, he's being very polite there, proposed extinction. The, the, remember the uh, abstract? It was pretty strong. Um, was due to a change in climate, namely decreased rainfall, claiming that juveniles were unable to tolerate extended dry periods. Shortly after the publication of the Gerlach paper, we received a comment article from Clive Hambler and co-authors, as reported in the Times on Saturday, uh, 20 September 2014. That's the article that I gave you the first two paragraphs of. That contested Gerlach's findings. Oh, they should have known this wasn't a good paper. After independent peer review, the paper, the commentary paper that said, no, no, it's not really extinct yet, was rejected. However, among the concerns expressed in the comment article submitted by Hambler et al. was doubt that the snail was extinct. The authors predicted that the snail would reappear in due course. That is, Hambler and company. In August 2014, the snail did reappear. Its rediscovery was announced by the Seychelles Island Foundation, which, as I recall, pays Gerlach, after it had been spotted by a member of a team exploring dense scrub in a remote part of Malabar Island, one of the largest, that's the second largest island in the Aldabra Atoll. 
In the light of this news, we were contacted by Clive Hambler in early September 2014, who requested that Gerlach's original article be retracted and the comment article he had submitted in 2007 be published. While in full agreement uh, with, of the need for an update to the scientific record, we declined to retract Gerlach's paper and invited Hambler instead to resubmit his 2007 comment article updated with evidence of the snail's rediscovery, an invitation he has until now declined. Does the rediscovery of R. Aldabra justify retraction? It is a normal part of the scientific method that findings published in good faith based on evidence available at the time may later be proved to be incorrect. In such a situation, journals have a range of options for alerting the scientific community. Some of these options are outlined on our website. Now, the article goes on immediately, and, but we're going to take a side view, uh, view into the options that are listed. So, a correction is normally used when a small portion of an over otherwise reliable publication proves to be misleading. Um, is, is that the uh, animal is extinct a small part? I don't know. A, a retraction notification of invalid results will be issued if work is proven to be fraudulent or as a result of a significant but honest error. Um, could be a significant but honest error. No? Certainly extinction seems to be three times in the abstract. Um, and it's not extinct, and we know that. Other variants include expression of concern, notification where the validity of the results are in doubt. Well, certainly the results are at least in doubt, no? Notice of redundant publication, which of course doesn't involve us. An addendum provides additional information or clarification. So what do you think? Do you think that this paper deserves one of those four? And if so, which one? Um, the format of notices, the notices, uh, if you do any one of those, notices have their own DOI, but are linked electronically with the original electronic publication. That's so that people who are searching, like librarians, will find the correction at the same time they find the original article, so they don't spout off in the original article and oops, uh, come to think of it, uh, it isn't actually true. They are published in a form that en enables indexing and abstracting services to identify and link corrections and retractions. The notice will be published at the end of the latest issue and will appear on the table of contents. So I scanned the table of contents of this particular issue and could not find anything that said correction, retraction, notice of redundant publication, or addendum. I went back, I showed you the one correction that was on the original article. Um, and it's easy enough to put those on electronically to the original article. Um, according to the Committee on Publication Ethics, journal edi editors should consider retracting a publication if, quote, they have clear evidence that the findings are unreliable, either as a result of misconduct, e.g. data fabrication, or honest error, e.g. miscalculation or experimental error. Anybody? Uh, it does seem that the findings were unreliable, no? And it doesn't matter whether it's dishonest or honest, you still put it there. End quote. Our considered view is that while the report of extinction in the Gerlach paper has lately been revealed to be incorrect, neither misconduct nor honest error have been the cause. What was the cause? Fairies? Hobgoblins? In this case, we believe the most appropriate action is for this new scientific evidence to be published, thus updating the scientific record. 
Oh, well. The principal purpose of this editorial, therefore, is to make this update to the scientific record clear prior to the possible publication of such evidence by publicizing the rediscovery and acknowledging that the claim by Gerlachian biology letters that Aldabra was extinct was incorrect. So it sounds like they're doing a, well, is it a retraction or is it a correction? Or is it an expression of concern? It's not really labeled, is it? So it's there, you'll find it, but you'll only find it if you happen to pick it up in your search and you may not connect it to the original article until you read it. In this editorial, I also want to strongly counter views expressed in the wider media about the integrity of our reviewing process. Ooh, somebody said maybe they cheated. And about the relationship between biology letters and the Royal Society. First, I can confirm that all papers published in biology letters are subject to most careful independent peer review. And second, I can reaffirm that the journal has complete editorial independence from any policy position adopted by the Royal Society. The Royal Society might have a policy position with regard to something about the snail. Hmm. Biology Letters, like all peer-reviewed journals, has the responsibility to ensure the continuing debate about scientific findings and theories, including those surrounding climate change. We believe the role of Biology Letters in this case is to ensure that discussion continues around the causes and possible impacts of climate change informed by the most accurate science possible. Climate change happens, there's no question. Well, I grew up in Missouri, so I know that the climate changes. Um, in this case, Gerlach's proposed extinction of R. aldabrae, and again, I think that's my error for not italicizing it, was cited by Cahill et al., which was referenced by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, in its latest report as one of the few convincing examples of species extinctions as a result of climate change. Ooh. The IPCCs consequently need to be made aware of the rediscovery of our Aldabra and the rediscovery needs to be brought to the attention of the wider public, not least to those seeking to question the relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and climate. Yeah, they get to know too. However, in so doing, it is also incumbent on us to point out that the rediscovery does not necessarily invalidate Gerlach's claim that decreased rainfall was and is the principal cause of the snail's apparent decline. You may recall that they used that precise phrase in the original paper. Where does this leave us? First, it leaves us with the need to have a renewed debate about the methods used to ex assess extinction probability, especially for small organisms. To that extent, we have commissioned an article to review this field of science. Uh, the method obviously didn't work. We need to recheck. Second, it leaves us with the continuing need to encourage research, including the potential role of climate change, to explain the striking pattern of biodiversity change that has occurred over the recent decades throughout the world. And finally, it leaves us with the knowledge and good news that our Aldabra is not extinct and that there is a renewed opportunity for conservation biologists to de devise a strategy for its future protection. So now that we it's actually it's still living, we really have to work on it. Now, uh, one of the references I think was to Forbes magazine. Um, uh, where Paul Rogers wrote a piece called Snail Rediscovered After Climatic Change Extinction. And this is again available on the internet. And um, I'm going to skip over some of it because it will repeat what we've already read about. But this is kind of, shall we say, information that hasn't been brought to our attention yet. Clive Hambler, a lecturer in biology at the University of Oxford, who criticizes the original paper but was ignored, told the Times, crying wolf over climate change in this way diverts attention from more pressing causes of extinction, such as the destruction of habitat and invasive species. 
In other words, climate change can actually decrease our awareness of what's actually going on in terms of extinctions. And skipping over stuff that we've already run into, Mr. Hambler and three other leading scientists wrote to the Royal Society in 2007 pointing out that, quote, the vast majority of the habitat is virtually inaccessible and has never been visited. They just looked at the stuff they could get to. It is unwise to declare this species extinct after a gap in known records of 10 years. We pre predict rediscovery when resources permit. Now remember, he's writing this in 2007 before we discovered, rediscovered the snail in 2014. The same two peer reviewers who approved Dr. Gerlach's original paper rejected their Clive's and company uh, rebuttal, which was therefore not published by the Royal Society Biology Letters. The journal has decided since then to refer such rebuttals to a third independent reviewer in the future. Well, you see, if you refer it to a reviewer, then what happens is the reviewer approved the original article, so the reviewer is taking it personally that you're saying the original article is no good. However, it declined to ret retract the Gerlach paper and publish the re rebuttal because it is seven years old. I guess if you get your paper to last long enough, you don't have to retract anything. Bjorn Lomberg, author of Skeptical Environmental, said, climate change is a real problem, but the way it is increasingly blocking sensible thinking is depressing. This is from a person who accepts climate change. Several individual snails, including some juveniles, were rediscovered on the UNESCO World Heritage Atoll on 23 August by Shane Bryce of the Seychelles Island Foundation which administers the site and was confirmed by mollusk expert Dr. Vincent Florence of the University of Mauritius. Well, you look at the photos, I mean, they, they're pretty obvious. Aldabra is one of the largest atolls in the world, Mr. Hambler told Forbes.com. Far too large, I'm sure that should be T-O-O, -O, far too large to ser uh, search exhaustively for a snail. It consists of four large coral islands around a shallow central lagoon, plus numerous small islets. The remote and inaccessible atoll is home to the world's largest population of giant turtles. The decline in reported records of the snail after the 1970s could be explained by a declining number of observers, and there has never been a serious sampling program for it, Mr. Hambler said. I'd argue the, the species should be categorized as of least concern in the ICUCN red list. There could easily be tens of thousands of them and the population might benefit from climate change, natural or, or anthropogenic. Sounds like a climate change skeptic. The scientists got into the debate and this is the first reference that I gave because it gives you a good overview but I uh, thought you'd be more interested in the original data. Um, in a paper that's entitled Snail Revival Raises Peer Review Debate and uh, subtitled Rediscovery of a Snail Thought to be Extinct has raised questions about the peer review process that approved the publication of the extinction report. Uh, I'd say, uh, and it's by somebody whose name I won't try to pronounce. Um, and um, <coughs> The, uh, again, it's on the internet, so you can look at it. Um, the scientist, and that's, uh, you know, you can see, well, good news for this, and again, and again I'm going to skip through because some of the stuff we've already read. Well, good news for snail lovers and conservationists, the animal's rediscovery ignited a debate about the validity of Gerlach's study. You don't say. As early as 2007, when Gerlach published his report linking the snail's extinction with climate change, biologist Clive Hambler of the University of Oxford and his colleagues submitted a comment to biology letters po pointing to data collection and analysis errors and requesting that the study be retracted. 
Hambler's comment was rejected for publication at the time. Now, in statements to media outlets, Hambler has once again voiced his concern about the study and called for a retraction. And in an email to the scientists, his frustration is clear as he cites catastrophic failure of the peer review and editorial process. Specifically, Hambler and his colleagues argue that the Gerlach study provided few details of the survey method used, missed some recorded observations of the species, and used climate change data that amplified the trend of lower rainfall. In addition, because the survey only sampled a small portion of the largely inaccessible islands, said Hambler, who argued with his co-authors in 2007 that more extensive searches would find the species, as proved to be the case in August. Um, said Hambler, I argued that any one of these errors should be grounds for retraction. Hambler told the scientists. That sentence could be worked on a little bit more. Biology Letters has declined to retract, however, according to an editorial penned by the journal's editor-in-chief, Rick Batterby, which we read most of. There are a lot of papers that have been published in the past and subsequently were found to be inaccurate, Batterby told the scientists. The fact that someone wanted to contest these analysis, the data, or the interpretation is just standard Just no comment. After the snail's reappearance, the journal invited Hambler to resubmit his com comment, but he has declined. I wanted the original manuscript published in some way, perhaps as a supplementary material explaining a retraction. Because they won't publish the original thing that he asked to be, which would be of historical value. Um, who added that he felt the journal's original handling of his rebuttal was unfair, possibly due to referees having a conflict of interest. Indeed, Hambler's comment was reviewed and rejected by the two peer reviewers who had reviewed Gerlach's 2007 paper. However, Batterby noted that this editorial process has since been revised to include independent peer reviewers not involved with the original submission. At that time, that was accepted as being the standard practice, he said. It has changed in line with current best practices. So, oops. Conservation biologist um, Resit uh, Ak Akswa Kaya uh, of Stony Brook University in New York agreed. At the time of the paper, the species had not been seen for three to five generations, maybe longer, uh, he said in an email to the scientists. In hindsight, it is easy to say it was premature to declare extinction. However, the dis rediscovery of a presumed extinct species does not necessarily mean that the ass assessment method or approach is wrong. <laughs> Just, it blows you away. <laughs> Nevertheless, now notice, there, there's nothing necessarily wrong. But, he added, who also chairs the IUCN committee that develops guidelines to assess threatened and endangered species, there's no doubt that the process of evaluating the species prevalence is in need of an overhaul. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's not wrong, but it needs an overhaul. Okay. ICUCN is working on more specific quantitative guidelines for declaring species extinct or possibly extinct, he said. Whoa. Now, my, my own take is the original paper by Gerlach is provably wrong in its core conclusion. It is simply amazing to watch the effort exerted to not retract or at least correct the original paper. Um, Eric Segal is famous for writing in his novel, Love Story, love means never having to say you're sorry. I guess being politically correct means never having to say you're sorry either. Uh, the main reason that science is more reliable than most human enterprises is not that it is purely sec secular as methodologic naturalism. It is rather that it is reproducible. So dishonesty or poor technique is more likely to be discovered than in some other areas of endeavor, such as 
history or religion. If one can make mistakes or even shade the evidence without any consequences, then science is no better than any other human endeavor and may be, because of its pretensions, considerably worse. Now, the temptation to cheat or be sloppy is particularly strong in science when is, one is drawing politically popular conclusions and when no one will attempt to reproduce one's findings. The research material, either because the research material is inaccessible or because the research is expensive, and of course, we already know that that's right anyway, so why repeat it? It's just a waste of time. We have to face that problem in science. Now, how widespread is this in science? This is where it gets ugly. Consider that in a non, well, at least less politically charged area. Of 53 preclinical cancer studies that Amgen research has tried to reproduce, 47 could not be reproduced. That's right, they had a reproduction value of somewhere around 11%. And that got into nature. We're not talking about something uh, minor. And uh, you can read the original article if you have it available, or you can read the, uh, uh, or you can read the summary. And uh, there's a commentary that's even more disturbing. And uh, it says, partway through his project to reproduce promising studies, Begley met for breakfast at a cancer conference with the lead scientist of one of the problematic studies, the ones that he couldn't reproduce. We went through the paper line by line, figure by figure, said Begley. I explained that we redid their experiment 50 times and never got their result. He said they'd done it six times and got this result once, but put it in the paper because it made the best story. It's very disillusioning. Yeah, I guess it is. Um, this has implications when one insists that only peer-reviewed literature counts. Peer review should theoretically increase quali quality. In fact, it appears that it can be used to reinforce political correctness. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. By the way, that's a photo of the snail itself. <coughs> yes, uh, we have a comment back there. I just recently noticed in the last week that the FBI is on the carpet for misinterpreting some hairs that would have sent people to prison and to death. Big mistake, but it happens. I guess maybe we should be a little more skeptical of science than we uh, commonly are. I, you know, I, I as a scientist don't like that because I prefer to think that science does better than this. <coughs> yes. Yeah, um, this is a fascinating case study that merits a lot more evaluation and research just on the process. I'm interested in process. I think all, all of us are interested in process of how do you find scientific truth. The bottom line is truth, right? Well, and but I have one point that is really important in this. It's important that this case gets labeled. You see, they're going to do the process all over again. But you know what? If they don't enforce it, it's as if it didn't exist. They need to call this thing, if not a, a retraction, at least a correction. Correction, the snail has yeah. been found. Can I be a little defensive on this as a librarian? I've read very extensively in scientific literature, especially uh, geology and paleontology. Um, science is not too worried about perfection because you never achieve it, right? you never achieve, achieve absolute truth, right. Uh, there are almost exceptions to everything that you put in print. That's a known aspect of science. And 
So they're willing to live with it. They're willing to live with an incomplete report. It's not a false report. He didn't fudge the data. It's not a false report. It's woefully incomplete. Actually, you incomplete. don't know that for sure. If you want to be very precise well, about it. Well, let's not get into let's, that. Let's, <laughs> let, let, remember, he found adult snails, but he felt, felt that they were all at least five years old. Yeah. Uh, you're you're uh, casting you, judgment now that it may be falsified. I, I, I don't think you have much grounds for that at this point, maybe down the road. That's a possibility it's falsified, but I think we have to be careful what we say on I, that. I think that it's possible that we're looking at things through rose-colored glasses. There well, happen yes. to be everybody I, else's rose-colored glasses. And, uh, and so, A, they published it prematurely. B, they shut down the opposition. And then C, when it came to light that they were absolutely provably wrong in their main assertion, they refused to correct it. Yeah. Now, see, I don't have a problem with saying a possible extinction, probable extinction, you know, but to use the word extinction without qualification, I think you have to retract that. I think some people would disagree with you, but we won't go that route right now. Um, what, what we can note is the rose-colored glasses are a paradigm of climate change, and there's two huge divisions on that. So this is a very good evidence of how your paradigm uh, can affect collection of data, conclusions, and so on. That part we can do. Um, now, extinction. Wouldn't you say that, the, that there should be some kind of a linkage between the editorial and the and No, the I'm going to be, I'm going to de be defensive of the scientific literature, and we have scientists here that maybe have published in biology field. Uh, Science is self-correcting. Even creationist literature can be way off base, and it, maybe it's five, ten years down the road before something comes to light. Uh, they don't go through the creationist research society quarterly and publish retractions. You know, that's they want a new article that will counter the old. So far, when you find maybe one or two or three snails that are still alive, you need a good scientific study that will prove why these were overlooked. You need a, a subsequent article, which hasn't come, but it'll probably come. Anyway, I'll, I'll defend the editors on that. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's more of a reflection of a lack of rigor in some areas of, of biological sciences. We don't see air bars uh, as we should in conclusions. And uh, you know, there's, in, you know, it, it seems to be, it's it's far less dealt with in a meaningful way in biology than it is in engineering, uh, and uh, it's just it just it seems to be pervasive, and that's I think that's the problem that that is uh, is underlying all this is that people are recognizing yeah we've all let things slide because we. We haven't gone through the process as we should to uh, see that the air bars are also included within our conclusions, and they're just not done, and and and, and thus uh, there's uh, you know they're 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 going to come to to conclusions like this um, based upon uh, not really considering what the full value of the uh, data is in terms of an absolute sense. So it, 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 uh, the objectiveness goes out the window as a result. He, wa he wasn't uh, completely guessing. Uh, you weren't here at first, so you missed. Uh, he had statistical data supporting his conclusion. And uh, on that basis, of course, he, he, got, he, he stopped at the 95% level. Uh, if, you, if you remember the figures there of uh, yeah. uh, security and so on, but he used that to back up his conclusion. Uh, so it, it uh, raises the interesting question, which uh, uh, starts a whole a whole new area of uh, discussion we don't know I get into about, for instance, uh, correlating tree rings. 
you can get 99.9 percent .9 correlation of tree rings between tree that, that we different know is false that you know are false. Uh, and so all of this raises a, a caution, I think. Uh, I am uh, of the opinion that uh, scientific papers and textbooks used to be more rigorous 20, 30 years ago than they are now. Uh, it seems that, they, you know, well, okay, well, we can revise it. It's okay to make errors and so on. This was not so tolerated in the past. Uh, uh, at least, uh, I mentioned this last week, uh, and I'll repeat it because it's so appropriate right here. Uh, Lakatos, or Lakatos, uh -huh. uh, made this statement referring to that very trend. He said, in the old days, we used to have waste paper baskets where you had a manuscript that wasn't proper and so on, you could put it in the waste paper basket. And if your friends told you the manuscript was bad, you could put it in the waste paper basket. Nowadays, we've got scientific journals to take the place of waste paper baskets. Uh, and I, I th it seems to me, at least in the geological literature, I, I'm... Uh, Lakatus d died several years ago, so he's, he's remarking on a trend that was back in the 70s or 80s at least. But some of the stuff that gets published in the geology literature, the public doesn't realize that the geologist thinks differently. He, he's not in the absolute. The journalists get hold of that, and that he, they publish it as an absolute, and so on. But it, it seems to me that uh, <coughs> scientists in general, and Adventist scientists in particular, need to try and reestablish a higher degree of reliability in scientific publications. And, and what we see coming out. Uh, the interesting thing is that Del Ratch, <clears throat> when he was discussing creationist versus evolutionist, he was saying that um, uh, in particular the creationist journal Origins stood out for being better than the rest of the creationist literature. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm saying that to the former editor of Origins. So. Yeah, well, th thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll add to it. Uh, uh, one prominent geologist made the comment about the journal Origins when I was uh, <clears throat> editing it. He said, Origins is the most scientific creation journal there is. He said, I don't agree with it, but it is the most scientific creation journal there is. And I, I thought that was... Uh, fairly good compliment, but we must not let down the standard because anything goes nowadays, kind of, uh, uh, whether it's in politics or anything else. I mean, you, you don't know where to follow laws anymore now. You don't know if they're going to be enforced or not. Uh, speed laws are not enforced on the yeah. highways, uh, so on. Uh, uh, we need to return back to, to some rigor here. Uh, I, uh, like I say, you know, if they want to call it a minor part, make it a minor part, and the rest of it is, you know, arguably okay. Uh, but there should be some kind of a notice that the snail has been found, and it should be linked to that article so that when people research it, uh, they'll find it. Otherwise, uh, what is the point of having corrections and retractions at all? Yeah. I have no problem with the original author and his observations. I think it was good that the fact that this little creature was in th possible danger of extinction was good, and there should have then be more research to follow it up. The two problems that are serious, one is the editorial policy, not to allow a divergent view to be recorded, is serious, and the guy should be, you know, lined up on the wall and said, hey, you're <laughs> out of here. And, and if they made it public, then other editors would sit too and say, okay, I better. The third issue here that are, the two of them are bad is that the, in the UK, they took the Royal Society too seriously and started to make policy when things and the evidence was not yet there. It should, the, the politicians and the government process should be skeptical mm -hmm. of scientists and realize that a scientist is no more honorable than anyone else. And here we have proof. Okay. 
just uh, comment here and then uh, well, I want you to repeat yours for the record. I work in an entirely different field of research, biblical. And what do you think the TOSC has been doing for the past three years? It's the same thing. I say what I want to say, and you can't stop me. Well, you can still do a letter to the editor, can't you? And it gets into the literature that way. Well, the document is that the guy sent a letter to the editor, and it was rejected. I, I've sent letters to the editor. Sometimes they, they won't publish it. Uh, and some journals don't allow letters to the editor, like the Geological Society of America Journal, which the top geology journal of the, of the world, probably. Uh, you can't get a letter into it, an article. There's a terrible article they published there that uh, uh, about the Permian Reef uh, and the uh, orientation. Uh, Warren Johns probably remembers that article, uh, and so on. Uh, using the criteria that did a completely random orientation would have given exactly the results they said because they, they restricted what th their definition of what was upright. I, I mean, they, I shouldn't say they restricted. They allowed anything almost to be upright. Uh, a anything that was within, uh, what, 60 percent? Well, and, and it, it didn't count it whether it's uh, upright or down. If uh, it was or, 33 or degrees up from the horizontal, it was upright. Yeah. But the worst mistake they did, never recognized the possibility in the random chain, in random, uh, half of them might be bottom side up. That, and that, you know, so you, you got everything, <laughs> automatically you get 66, 67 percent of your sponges to be upright with those criteria, because you don't recognize that half of them could be bottom side up. Now, I wrote to the uh, author of the article uh, because it had been, s another paper had been published earlier on this, pointing out that, hey, a lot of these sponges in this Permian Reef uh, grew bottom side up in chambers. Uh, and so <laughs> I told him, what about this, and so on, I said, and look, randomly, yeah, this is, he says, well, I, I talked this over with the uh, author and so on. We decided that paper was anecdotal. And so uh, they went ahead and published this, but it's there, you know. And uh, it's, it's there, and then it gets used. The stuff that gets into the peer-reviewed literature is now worshipped, and the stuff that doesn't isn't. And the journal won't accept a letter. Yeah. But, um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it happens... The, the thing of it mm -hmm. is that it needs, you know, when you are provably wrong, there needs to be a notice of that. Uh, if, mm -hmm. At the bare minimum, a notice of concern. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a wonderful mm -hmm. paper, but you need to know that there's this mm -hmm. other paper out there. The, the and it needs to be indexed mm -hmm. with the paper. Mm -hmm. The author of that paper on the thing is, uh, you know, world-recognized authority on, on coral reefs. Uh, Obviously not a world-recognized authority on mathematics. Uh, <laughs> and so on. And he, uh, he defended some of his other points. You see, the raised, he, raised, he said 74% of those sponges in that reef are upright. That was his conclusion. The way he got from 66 to 74 is that he, he allowed some of them in his diagrams, and I pointed this out to him. Hey, th this is not... Uh, it doesn't meet your stated criteria. It doesn't meet your criteria. You stretch it a little bit here, and you stretch it on this one a little bit. That's the way he got 74%. And it's in the literature there. And people pick this up and say, hey, you know, this permanent reef, it grew there, obviously. Uh, it grew there because the sponges are upright. Uh, but it, the data fits very well with just a purely random tumbled in deposit, yeah. as you'd expect during the flood. Now, see, the thing of it is, in this particular case, if you think about it, if nobody ever gets even the most obvious corrections or the most obvious statements of concern attached to their paper, then all of the wonderful sounding peer review stuff doesn't mean a thing. There is no enforcement. There is no proof of, you know, and it's it's... 
Well, that, that's a fur further thing you need to keep in mind here. Peer review, of course, means, hey, several people looked at this paper. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean it's infallible. And I can tell you, as an editor of a journal, a peer-reviewed journal, that it is not the peers that are essentially deciding whether or not that article will be published. And that this is a very serious admission I'm making here. The editor who picks the peer reviewers decides whether or not that article is going to be published. It is really a one-person decision uh, in, in a, a peer-reviewed journal. The editor and the editorial board have final say. They often veto what the uh, peers are saying. It's very, very common. And it's even some my experience uh, trying to get published in the creationist literature. Um, can I just comment on creationist Certainly. literature? Since uh, that's my real passion is, as a librarian is <laughs> to see what creationists are doing because I am a creationist. Anyway, uh, a prime example of something that was retracted were the human footprints alongside dinosaur tracks in Paluxy, Texas. I'm going to be there this summer. The librarians are me meeting at Southwestern Adventist. I hope we can talk some more about it, maybe even have a, another um, study just on Paluxy. It would be a good you know, one. It, while you're there, there are claims that there are new footprints that are being found. It would be worth, your, uh, worth all will, of a while if I you will look talk in there to and bring, the, uh, bring back a report. I'll talk to the, all the park authorities. It's a, now a state park. It's protected, but there will be people there, I'm sure, experts. You want, you want to go to the museum there, uh, the Creation Museum there? I will go to the Creation Museum there. and see actual human footprints. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, this was something that was retracted, and the, one of the lead retractors was the son of Henry M. Morris. Now, that took courage on his part. He's an honest man, I believe, to this day. His father, Henry Morris, in the book Genesis Flood, 1961, had photographs of the human footprints with the five toes. Now, the caption says, courtesy of Burdick, Clifford Burdick, good Avenist geologist. He was a geologist, been long deceased. Uh, the way they're presented is not as absolute fact, but possibility. I, I'll give Morris credit. It wasn't, there was no article by Burdick proving these are human footprints, but the suggestion was you should find a human and dinosaur next to each other. Uh, and it wasn't until about 20 years later after the uh, river had done a lot more erosion and new tracks were coming up and trackways that they found what they thought were human footprints were part of a trackway of oh, clearly five, five feet or six feet apart of a, a two-legged dinosaur. Um, now, retraction. True, there wasn't an article originally on that but I think the retraction should have been in the lead journal, uh, Creation Research Society Quarterly. And Henry Morris was on the board at that time, very active. So they should have made a bigger deal of the attraction. Otherwise, it, um, in lieu of that, it was published in a little tiny insert in Acts and Facts. The, uh, they have an impact series. So even creationists, we like to maybe s keep our errors a little bit low key and not always tell the whole world this is human nature so that's my comment on that. uh, you, you are aware uh, that the article that kind of broke the uh, so ice on that thing was by origins. Bernie Newfelt in Origins. Bernie Newfelt in Origins. Where we, we sliced those beautiful specimens, yeah. which incidentally, uh, Washington Missionary College at the time paid $1,000 for those oh. specimens. 
uh, because here is proof of the flood. We talked them into letting us slice a corner off those things. Uh -huh. And we demonstrated that those were carved. They were not pressure depressions because you could follow the lines yeah. through. They just come up to the carved part and go straight, I mean, and across. There was no depression whatsoever. These no. were not footprints. And you, you sliced a dinosaur put footprint and was able to show that the oh, yeah. Yeah. dinosaur prints and went down. Yeah. You have a little bit of layering in, it's kind of a mm -hmm. sandy limestone. Mm -hmm. You have a little layering and it shows mm -hmm. the depression of the layering mm -hmm. of the heavy weight of the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. and that's true. And there again, Origins being a top creationist journal, the top one in my opinion, was willing but, uh, to uh, correct uh, that. But uh, when you go there, uh, Check that article out by Bernie Neufeld. I will. Uh, because uh, they could not find good human imprints of what the trackway they were claiming was human. That was the other side of the story. So I'm, I'm anxious to know what the new ones are like. Yeah. And I'll bring back photos. Maybe a video. I need a video. <laughs> Produce a video. Uh, there, there is a uh, evangelical video produced back in the 1970s, Footprints in Stone. They retracted that. It was no longer sold or circulated, and they discouraged local churches that had bought it from even showing it. So that, that was an amazing self-correction among creationists. It takes a lot of courage to do that. A lot of it courage. It takes a lot of courage, it does. Well, next week, get ready for the molecular clock. And uh, we'll see you all then.